Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bartlett Guest Seminar Series, Speculative Design. So speculative design is a roundtable seminar that discusses the meaning, impact, and applications of speculation in design. Every seminar, we will be inviting guests from all over the world with various disciplinary backgrounds to discuss a sub-theme on speculative design. So this is a precious opportunity that is enabled by the rise of the Zoom sphere to connect Bartlett students with a global network of interdisciplinary people and trends to make the best out of 2021. This seminar series invites not just architects, but people working in different disciplines to map a bigger picture of where we are today in history and how they think their disciplines translate into the built environment. Moreover, the series focus on inviting young forces and people in their early careers to discuss their visions and how school of thoughts can be bridged to emerging industries. For instance, in the past, we have invited George Papam from Greece to tell us his work that stands at the convergence of geography, geoengineering, and speculative models at a planetary scale. We have also had Alberto Fernandez from Chile, um, PhD at UCL, to discuss the scientific history of automata theory and his application of it in coastal fog and water capturing system. You can catch up on these past trends on my YouTube channel or Instagram. The link will be posted also in the chat box. Before I introduce our guests for today, I'd like to advertise that the next seminar would be on the week of 31st June, where we invited Famsi Krishna from Futurely and Mariana from Sahahadi to talk about their experiences in world building. Very exciting. So this week, we invited three guests to share their experiences and visions from their, um, their German academic scene, a country with a rich history in continental philosophy. So the format of this seminar is going to be an academic roundtable where each of the participants is given equal rights to give a pitch on their vision, after which they will debate around the central theme on their agreements and disagreements. The floor is open, of course, and audiences are welcome to participate in a debate and challenge them with questions. So you can either raise your hand, type your questions in a chat box, or scream out loud your thoughts. So first, we have Victor Sardenberg, Associate Researcher in Digital Methods and Architecture at Leibniz University Hangover, where he researches and develops a computational framework for quantification of the architectural aesthetic experience. Then we will have Wong Shok Che, currently teaching in Wuppertal University and launching a design company in Germany. He'll be discussing with us urban topology and form in formulating a theory from both academic and business perspectives. Last but not least, we will have Jonathan Sutanto, who with his peer alumni of Shadow Shula Architecture class, co-created Katakombe, a serial event of decentralized perspectives. His trajectory center on representation about unspoken thoughts and otherness, interrevolving topics such as non-human, racial disparity, trauma and desire, carbon footprint, and redistribution of power. Without further ado, Victor, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here today. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, okay, okay. You are, you're already seeing too much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Always the same struggle. Here <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Provides. For me, it's a, it's a honor to, to join everybody today. In this beautiful morning, very sunny here in Berlin. Um, I will need to entertain you for a few seconds while it loads. Oh yeah. Okay, this is good. This is nice. So yeah, that's, we should talk about speculative design today and efficiency. And somehow it fits in a strange way with the work that I've been doing. Um, I'll mostly, I will only show you what I call my nighttime job. That is projects that are self-commissioned that I do for myself because I have the urge to do it. So maybe we start with some question marks of well, what the hell is speculative design? And I'm not sure that I will give you a conclusive answer. I think that I can, I point you towards some different directions. And I think that the first step, if you want to make sense of this kind of work, is to understand architecture in similar terms of what David Royce says, that architecture is the discipline that produces the image of reality. 
So I would say that what I've been doing in the last few years with this project is to articulate into image what the word is, what the word could be, and even more important, what the word should be. So I'm interested in how architecture as a cultural practice can respond to the strange effects of contemporary capitalism. So you see stuff like suicidal attacks, uh, mass immigration, Putin, Bolsonaro, the Brexit, alternative facts, AI, bubble algorithms, global warming, the Anthropocene, pictures that look like renderings and renderings that look like pictures. And now we have the coronavirus that is just the latest one. So I would say that in face of these facts, most of architecture try to do is to remediate the malaise of neoliberal capitalism. And I'm interested in asking myself how architecture can respond to these events in a scalable way. So first I would like to talk about drawings. So don't worry, I will not show you only black and white, boring old pictures. This first project, my question was, if in the 20th century, this is how social housing used to look like, how would be the image of social housing in the, 21st century, in the 21st century? So inspiring ideas from hip hop and techno culture, I am interested also in remixing and sampling architecture. So I'm taking the floor plan of uh, Corbezier rotating it and building a section of that with the original elements of the original section. And also I'm taking the original section of that, rotating it and populating it with the elements of the original floor plan. So the first thing I want to bring to attention today is that here architectural drawing is not a representation of a slice of existing building or a building that will come to existence. It's not something that will be translated from drawing to glass and steel. The drawing here is the product itself. The drawing is a tool to think. The drawing is a tool to produce the image of reality. So I would say that Architecture is more like an idea that can exist in multiple mediums. So I don't see a hierarchy between a drawing, a rendering, a building, a 3D model, a scale model, animation, movie scenery, text, literature, backdrop. I would say that all these mediums are proper medium for architecture. So if social housing was in the suburb of the European post-war city, Nowadays, I would say that it exists in a mega cities of unbelievable populational growth and a habitational deficit like Hong Kong here. And its inhabitants nowadays, it's not only human anymore, but also capital accumulation. Another project, I also designed a city inside a building where all sorts of objects are welcome to live inside. So some parts of the building are not inhabitable by human beings. And I would argue that architecture always produced shelter for all kinds of objects, including humans. And it has been happening for a long time. So to exemplify, I will show you two other buildings that I think are interesting to prove my point. So the first one is the AT&T Tower in New York. No windows, no natural lighting, no natural ventilation. The building is designed for the comfort of computers. Its inhabitant is data. So what we call the cloud is not something material flying around. The cloud, the cloud is a big damn building somewhere else. And for me, it's interesting because the way that we are educated is that architecture is a humanist endeavor. Uh, but humans are just one of the many inhabitants of architecture like data here. 
are another inhabitant, capital. This tower was fully built for condos, one per, per floor, but nobody moves in. Um, it was all bought, bought by corporations as investment. One way to, to understand it is to say that it's empty, but I don't think so. I think it's not empty. I think it's inhabited by capital. And capital has an, another idea of what is comfort for it. So the quality criteria for capital is safety from natural, um, economic and natural accidents. So this is how you access my building that has all this data and capital and human inhabitants. This is how it's placed in this beautiful Italian village. And this is how it looks like. So I think that for me, the importance of this project is to produce the image of what we are proposing in a society. I would argue that this is a caricature of what we are dreaming about. It is showing us um, more clearly the characteristics of a specific uh, character, for example. So I would say that uh, what architecture is doing is producing this image of reality today and in the future. And the caricature is bringing awareness of how this future will look like. And I wouldn't say that it's utopic or dystopic, I would just say it's a realistic project. And in face of the tough times that we are living as uh, species, it's important to start to produce this kind of image because there is this feeling that there is not so much imagination around viable futures because what we have right now, it's not a viable future. And I would argue that to imagine is to produce image. And I would say that the role of the architecture of the architect is to produce change through the production of image that are able to make us imagine alternatives. So other stuff that I'm also interested, like contemporary trends in architecture, like buildings on top of buildings, and buildings on top of buildings, and buildings on top of buildings, and buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings, top of buildings losing relation to the grounds. So I start to think about what about an architecture that has no grounds and what kind of new urbanization model it could be. So the interior of, of it, it's a seamless collage of some of the most famous 20th century building, the Bauhaus, Honchamp, um, HSBC in Hong Kong, uh, AG Factor, Villa Savoie. And maybe it's an ideal model of occupation for the territory in the Chinese sea. And I, I think it's interesting to think that we only, we take the ground as granted and we only become aware of that in an earthquake or when it completely disappears. And I think that uh, the relation between architecture and buildings and the ground always carries a political idea of what is the role of um, the subjects in, in, in society, what is the role of these objects in the city. And I think that to look at this new form of relationships are able to reveal new political ideas. They are able to, um, to, to create some kind of political imagination that is able to create new city diagrams. So this is a city without a ground and this is a ground without a city. This is the Great Atlantic garbage vortex. All this plastic uh, disposal is being took to this, this vortex in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a ground that is being used as a proof of the Anthropocene. That is the term that defines that the biggest force, the biggest geological force nowadays is humans. Um, so since this ground is not being occupied, I decided to propose a mode of urbanization for that. Um, 
Mm. I'm not sure if the Anthropocene is the most precise um, term for the geological era that we are living. So, for example, the philosopher Timothy Morton says that a floating piece of styrofoam in the ocean transcends place because it could come from anywhere, from Brazil, from China, from Germany, who knows? It transcends classes because it can be produced by someone with poor or rich. So I think that what Timothy Morton and the term Anthropocene are doing here is flattening the responsibility of the production of this new ground, is flattening the responsibility between all humans of the climate change. And I would say that it's, it's more precise to understand what we are living right now, according to the term capitalocene, being capital, money, 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 the major, the major force of transformation in our planet. So one phase of capitalocene we know very well, that is the privatization of profits, like we know how Bezos is having a great time with the coronavirus pandemic. But there's another phase that we don't see it so often or we are not so aware. There is the socialization of losses and pollution and the great Atlantic garbage vortex is an example of that. <clears throat> so in the capitalocene, the most absolute form finding and form making algorithm is capital itself. So let's look back at our good old Corbusier and the way that we were educated about architecture as a humanist and anthropocentric uh, discipline. So the paradigm of this view of anthropocentric architecture is the Maison Dominant. Like it was never built by Courbezier exactly like that, but we all live inside one of these. And we live and work inside one of these. I would be very surprised if you guys are not inside one of these right now. And I would say that here, all the effort is to create a humanist use value. So let me make a dissociation between two concepts. Uh, use value against exchange value. So use value of this pen is the possibility of using it to write. This is the use value of that. But it also has an exchange value that is how much someone would pay to acquire that, like two euros, for example. Um, neoliberal uh, economists, they say that uh, the markets are perfect to equalize use value to exchange value. But I would argue that it's not really like that. I would say that the capitalism evolved in such a manner that its use value became completely unrelated to its exchange value. So architecture became a vessel for money investment. And I will show you how the, this diagram is outdated. This three meters floor to floor height became extremely inefficient. So here we have our words. To support this point, I made the simple AI. It's optimizing a project according to capitalocentric values, not anthropocentric, capitalocentric values. Um, so real estate is defined always by exchange value that is always related to area, to square meters. And human use value of architecture, the possibility of occupying that by a human is always defined in spatial and volumetric terms in cubic meters. So what the AI here is doing is minimizing cubic meter to maximize square meter. So it's optimizing your profits. 
So what used to look like that should look a little bit more like that. This is a review diagram of the new inhabitant of architecture, capital investments. It's freeing architecture from its use value so it can be inhabited by pure speculative investments, which sounds pretty bad to us as human beings. And I, I know that some of you are in London and it's a, a, a very tough um, real estate market for students. But let's not be so sad about it because if something you can learn from me today is that every problem is always an opportunity. Every problem is always an opportunity. This is a day that I've been waiting for years and years. From time to time, a revolutionary idea comes and changes everything. If we are lucky, we see it in our lifetime. And I think this is one of these cases. This idea will not change only the way we design, it will change the way we live. So today I'm announcing my startup, this lab stack. We optimize your real estate for peak value. We utilize AI to maximize your return on investment. Don't waste cubic meters with emptiness for humans when you can generate more profit with a stack of slabs. It's smart, it's precise, it's safe. It works like magic. So here is the sample section with an optimal area to volume ratio. And we have the patent of it. The first example, this is the first implementation in Monaco, the most expensive square meter in the planet. Here, you have it in Manhattan. Why making millions if you can make billions? Or even your home. Why not transform your home into commodity? So, meet our team. We are a startup company which goes to develop optimization algorithms to improve the efficiency of capital accumulation. Isn't that great? Get in touch, join us, become our partner. I'll show you now our first ads. Efficiency is a powerful word and a powerful idea. It makes us look at the world and want to innovate, to improve, to reinvent. We put the best team together for it, enhancing your real estate for peak value. Efficiency is in everything we do, in our core values, products, and even stronger commitment to the environment and the future. We maximize your real estate development's floor area by eliminating vacant volume. Our company carefully develops algorithms to optimize your capital accumulation. We utilize AI to boost your return on investment. It is safe, it is smart, and it is precise. It works like magic. For us, efficiency is a force of nature. It drives us to build a better future. Join us to change the world. Become our partner. The Slab Stack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. It's amazing every time I hear your narrative and your world feel. So without further delay, let's go to Wong. All right. Um, let me share my screen. Yes, please. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. Um, okay. 
Right? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Won Sok Che. I'm an architect uh, currently uh, working with Professor Holger Hoffman at uh, Design and Representation Methodology Laboratory in Wuppertal University, Germany. I'm going to talk about the meaning of form in architecture. My argument is that the meaning of form in architecture and its special relationship with urban typology is something that we need to monitor when it comes to speculative design. First, I would like to thank to um, provide for the precious event. Before starting, I need to warn you that all the philosophical content in the presentation contains intentional or in unintentional distortions from the original philosophy. Most of them are collected based on speech act validation process by multiple architects in history. For the sake of speculative design, all the polemics, dialectics, and didactics are considered as a scientific research on top of artistic expression. My understanding of speculative design is located between the notion of science and art. It is uh, between or together with a certain system of knowledge in history and visual expression of form. Because of the genre specificity, the crossing uh, more than two disciplines, uh, speculative design is often ac accused for the lack of authenticity. Let's talk about the form. I, without hesitation, can say that I learned architecture creates form, especially in my master study at Städtische Architecture class. My mentor, Johann Bertim, always pointed out that architecture is all about making forms for all the other following concepts, such as space, sensation, or feeling, etc. Johann's lessons were very much pointing out that making form is making shape. My specialization was architecture and aesthetic practice, where the class explores the quality of interdisciplinarity around everything before architecture. Therefore, you talk about aesthetic quality from other fields, such as light, choreography, or even food, to apply on top of our, uh, aesthetic quality of architecture. You develop a strange or striking design method and design with what is defined as architecture. The secret was uh, to reduce the gap between architecture and the other field. In my case, I had to reduce the gap between architecture and cooking. As mentioned, this type of artistic form making process is often criticized by theorists or historians. Histor uh, historian Alberto Perez Gomez talks about transcendental quality of architecture on top of artistic expression, science, and language as interpretation of form. Particularly, he criticizes this uh, formal language usually ending up with architecture for architects or uh, technological decoration with arbitrary historical quotations. I took this diehard historical comment as something uh, speculative designers who deal with forms can consider as a lesson. Okay, what is then form? Have you ever tried to even look at the definition of form? Uh, don't we take the meaning of form for granted as a shape too, obviously? I, it was totally shocked to me when reading 1840s words and buildings. He just simply betrayed my previous belief about form as shape. Uh, 1840 states that uh, form is the most problematic and enigmatic term. Then what about the meaning of formal? Is it, is it only adjective form or form? 1840 says that the meaning of formal has all the complications from the meaning of form, and there are two more. The first is the opposition of informal, and the second is pejorative connotation. It is bad whatsoever. In 1981, a theorist, Kenneth Frampton, organized the meaning of formalism into two, old and new. Kenneth Frampton conceptualized formalism within the modernist, modernist frame, the old formalism is not different from what 1840 defined with the 10 forms. In one way or another, it is related to artistic, therefore it is self-contained or reflexive, revealing its own reality. It follows its own internal law. 
On the other hand, the new formalism is instrumental. This means that it is transparent to function and the world. The new formalism st started emerging by rejecting the former, of course. For example, in 1923, Ms. van der Rohe criticizes the concept of form harshly. However, it is clear that he did not actually reject the form, but he needed his own. Uh, because of that, in 1927, uh, he suddenly pulled back his rejection from the previous statement. Mies only rejected the forms for form, but paradoxically, his form was not in it. So I'd like to argue next to Mies van der Rohe that there is another form and formalism. My argument is based on uh, a series of type theories in 20th century. The meaning of form by theories such as Manfred Tafri, Anthony Wiedler, and Raphael Moneo can be recapitulated as the process of decontextualization. The decontextualization is a withdrawn form from social and historical context, which will go through again recontextualization. Because of process of withdrawal, the meaning of form is strategically distanced from the reality of history and society and excessively engaged with the internal and artistic re uh, reality next to scientific methodology in historical aspect. First of all, in 1976, a theorist, Anthony Wiedler, talked about transformation of formal structure and typical institu institutions. The, me uh, the meaning of structure here can be defined as both internal structure within forms, like skeletons, and the external structure as a cognitive background setting, such as historical and social uh, context. What is so special about the formal uh, structure? In 1978, Rafael Moneo provided uh, the definition of formal structure. The meaning of formal structure is defined with the combination of two terms, uh, gestalt and re uh, reality. Gestalt is a characterized form as a deep and abstract geometry, the sense of reality comes with the social and historical context projected on the forms. Therefore, the meaning of form, formal structure can be combined with both uh, internal structure as gestalt and external structure as history and society. Here we need to ventilate the meaning of context. In the original gestalt psychology, context provides a primary framework to determine the form, you're not allowed to talk about the hippo or elephant from the image on the right. You're only allowed to answer between rabbit or dog. On the contrary, the, the meaning of context in architecture gestalt, specifically used in the 20th century typology, gives a lot more freedom, like uh, Hermann Rorschach's inkblot uh, test. Your perception and following cognitive process is not determined within a conventional meaning of context in rigidity. Let's take one more example of architectural gestalt. In 1963, Robert Venturi defined the meaning of context with more or less conventional def uh, definition of context. Context provides meanings and relationship with the form. This is very interesting because uh, Venturi changed this attitude completely after uh, this famous trip to Las Vegas in a few years. Uh, on the contrary, at the same year, 1963, Peter Eisenman, is, in his doctoral thesis, uh, the, the former basis of modern architecture, he presented the concept of form as gestalt psychology. In opposition to Venturi's understanding of gestalt, um, gestalt provides a formal quality without any subjective interpretation, which means gestalt provides form that are withdrawn from context or gestalt. Of gestalt psychology. Then the question is how formal structure withdraws context. Anthony Wiedler and Rafael Moneo introduced the language of fragments. The design language of fragments is involved in the decomposition process of both form and context to represent the discontinuous reality in urbanism. The language of fragments literally breaks things and meanings uh, from authoritative entities such as elements of architecture and the city. In 1973, earlier than Villa and Moneo, uh, uh, Manfred Tafri explains the emergence of language of fragments. 
in, archi uh, in architecture in relation to the 18th century's landscape. The way the landscape paintings represent the formal reality is linked to architecture's formal reality and its representation. Especially the landscape painting take, uh, can be characterized with the language of fragment by breaking down the previous ideologies in form and context. Uh, for example, um, landscape paintings show the language of fragment, the broken pieces in un uh, unconventional perspective. Uh, the form of fragment includes the intentional dilapidation as fiction or virtual forms. Hafri introduced Piranesi's Campomatio as a fragmentation itself. Uh, the way the single uh, architecture fragment is situated is totally disconnected from the previous ideology and broken down into uh, fragmental form and meanings. Uh, because of that, uh, the, the fragments are situated in a context that it does not condition formally. In, con uh, in conclusion, the design language of fragment requires a few conditions. First, it needs the existing form. The second, the symbolic meaning must be distanced yet, not erased completely. Third, it needs to break down all architecture convention. It needs a scientific approach. If it does not, uh, it does not take the nostalgic ideal, uh, ideologies for granted. Six, uh, it needs to construct Typology, especially this means that the process is not remaining in a single case, singular case study, yet um, it, become, it becomes a framework for the other as a collective uh, case study. When I look back my study in master degree, I could see how language of fragment transforms into another form. The design language which Richard Meyer transformed from Le Corbusier's formal language is again transformed under the concept of excessive paradigm. For example, in this uh, image of, of the center represents how the center and periphery relationship transforms. For the intention of interdisciplinarity from cooking process, the reassembled fragments go through so-called fermentation in conceptual level, uh, which represented through uh, a certain programming procedure in digital environment. Ever since uh, Stradish architecture class, my study keeps going with the transformation of formal structure with the language of fragments. Uh, then I suggested this didactic approach to the people who had no idea about architecture. It is very interesting, it is very interesting to see uh, and lead this uh, first year bachelor group to architecture, architecture. This course, uh, simply because their understanding of the word sign system is very, uh, very much struggling with the formal practice of architecture. This is the beauty of the works, and I do, uh, I, and I don't think it is not very different from our situation where a group of intellectuals from the renowned universities are struggling to communicate to the world outside of architecture. The, the students are asked to define the notion of cube and, def uh, and design with the given building references. What is interesting from this pseudo scientific art project is in the cognitive process of defining significant forms such as cube or cross form. My fundamental question about this project lies in the process of sign in architecture. Put it not put it on other terms that I'm interested in the process of uh, defining forms whether it starts from symbolic meaning of historical or social, uh, social structure, or it starts simply uh, forming from architecture form within itself. I would like to show you one of the um, uh, interesting projects in detail from the experimental design studio in this narrative. The project title is Productive Enterprise. Uh, this project is about capitalistic understanding of elderly house, the retirement house, and its formal relation to the monastery type. The design was conducted on one of the withdrawn or stop working factory in Pupatar, and it turned into either unconventional elderly house or unconventional monastery deeply rooted in capitalism. The project starts anal analyzing one random building in the city. Putar and 
its typological relationship with the monastery in the 12th century. The project deals with capitalism and its influence on form of life, which is derived from the earlier form of monastery. Aure uh, Pierre Vittoria Aureli argues that asceticism in monastery is not just a contemplative condition or a withdrawn form from the world, uh, but is above all a way to radically question the given social and political conditions in a search for a different way to live one's life. The monastery shows that a quality of communitarian life through a consistent organization of time and space. Uh, Aureli says that this is the, the most con uh, controversial aspect of monastery because it shows how this uh, institution is uh, the ancestor of disciplinary institutions such as the prison, the garrison, the hospital, and the factory. Moreover, uh, uh, monasteries, the management concept is the foundation of modern contemporary forms of production uh, for capitalism. The St. Galan uh, monastery is uh, one of the first form of design mon monastery for productive life form. This means that uh, the plan drawing of St. Galan a monastery was designed not only for the future construction, but also for the formal instruction of communal life. So I went there to get the plan drawing. Um, as you see, the, the plan drawing contains a lot of symbols beyond the simple representation of built environment. Instead, it contains a lot of decorative instructions in symbols for communal life form, absolutely beautiful and So we, um, we did the, the similar things, uh, inventing uh, many symbolic representation within and out of architecture to create notation drawing on top of uh, language of fragment. So what I like about this project is, the, is this project delivers a set of complications from the meaning of formal structure in both formal and representational aspect. By referring the plan drawings of St. Galan, the project explores the possibility of a new way of representation in architecture. Therefore, the second, uh, the, the, the 2D drawing, uh, 2D plan drawing does not only uh, follow uh, the conventional method of representation of, uh, for the capitalist market, but it fully explores the the representational reality itself. After all, it recontextualizes with, the, with uh, completely uh, irrelevant context to speculate the meaning of form in architecture and its representation. Um, the conceptual relevance of uh, decontextualization to, to today's architecture discourse uh, can be questioned and it is actually interesting. Um, in short, for example, Peter Eisenman's virtual architecture is dedicated to not only remove context, but also reassemble uh, the decontextualized form um, into a literally meaningless form, therefore the new meaning at the end. Michael Young's perfection withdraws uh, all the familiarity out of the object uh, to relocate the sensation. For the last, Benjamin Bratton's uh, new normal detaches human interventions from urban environment run by uh, the megastructure beyond our perception. Uh, uh, I'll finish with a quotation from uh, one anthropologist, David Val uh, Valentine. Uh, the, te uh, the technique of decontextualization provides a radical rethinking of what it could be human with other humans and non-humans in differently configured at, uh, atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really admire how you structure historiography around something like formalism, something that we would think it's very nostalgic, but now you renewed it in a very contemporary context. So thank you. And now let's go to Jonathan, our last guests. Hi, everybody. Thank you for 
holding yourself until the last session. I mean, it is not the last session, right? There will be something like there will be a discussion coming after this. Yes, afterwards. Okay. Um, Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan. I'm um, I'm currently actually working for for uh, for uh, an architectural practice in Germany. Um, I would probably uh, explain a little bit uh, why why the background of 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 my project will be a little bit different than the other of my two co uh, my two peers. Uh, that that they went to this acad to the German academic scene, and I went from what I would say nothing so much like nothing so much as a German academic, but ending up in, in, in a German practice. And I've been doing all this work uh, during the weekends after the work uh, for my own interest. Uh, but we could probably discuss how. At the end, probably it will. It, it, it's it, the, the, the context itself kind of like build my whole uh, interest in this, so to say, out of the practice project. Um, I've been keeping myself um, surrounded. Uh, with projects and research with the themes of otherness. Uh, I've been asking myself, why do I have to focus on the other? I'm also aware that otherness is a constantly changing notion, depending who is talking and who is considering. Um, my other might not be the same with your other, but they could also be. However, in the regards of speculative design, I do believe that engaging with other could also optimize the work, the work itself uh, by recognizing the other as something that we should not be excluding can also be an alternative to maximize the result. Um, in the series of crises and disasters, we argue that Earth is suffering, that we as humanity is poisoned. We are poison, we are virus, we destroyed the planet. Um, I do have question where, what are we truly advocating here? Are we truly advocating the other or are we actually trying to create a self argument to save ourselves? Um, as you can see, this is a building uh, composed by other building uh, from treasures of consumption. Uh, it has time of its own. It keeps watching human come and go, converse about it, market about them, watching even the, uh, the cosmic constellation, the sky changes fastly. It has a massive scale, but they're still aware of the small things like birds or insect flying around it. It houses animals. Oh, excuse me. It houses animals that have lost their homes uh, at their habitat, so to say. You might think that the rooms are too dark and too small or too inhuman, but this is their home now. Senseless design, if a critic can say, um, but animals are able to navigate inside, flying, crawling, climbing in between those undulating interiors. 
last but not least, the drones are joining the group, swarming inside. Their mechanic visions recognizes the path. So should we call this building robotic or animalistic? Other than hum humanistic, I suppose. So I began to curious about towers and started to put myself on the perspective of the towers. Um, let us think that, may, do, do they have senses? Do, can they see something? And how, if they do see something, how do they exactly see? And I think that perhaps mesh and vision can be an eye of a building like an addition to their, to visualize their sight. Like take example of how probably in, the, in, in, a, in a practical level that sensors that we install in a building, they help, they sort of help the building to sense if there's a human inside if, and they can auto, automate the electricity. And also when, for example, the wind's too strong and they automated the retraction of the windows blind and so on. Could they probably even uh, communicate with each other? Can they dream about each other? And I start to see the series of images how they can imagine how other buildings should look like. And it, it seems to me that they actually, the, the, what if they have a desire or a dream and uh, if the architecture or, or towers can hallucinate? And by the way, human also hallucinate reality all the time. And nobody hallucinates reality in the exact same way because we don't have a proper, because of the uh, compression of the brain, the information that was taken from the brain, it has to visualize something. And uh, there is a lot of elimination that your brains apply to, to the, actually, the actual image that you see. So our brain curated the reality as we know it, but sadly nobody has the full access to what reality is. Uh, needless to say, I will say even machine vision can be can 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 start to envision the side of a satellite. I mean, I'm always very interested in the uh, uh, in the idea there is this multi, there is this optimum eyes that keep watching on. Uh, side of the world, it looks very public, it looks very city, but uh, it was used to be not super available for everybody until recently. And then probably this satellites also hallucinates. They, they, they spoliate and craft the landscapes to the point that we can, we can speculate what does this all means? Does, does this green, does this blue means nature? Do, do they mean forest? Does the brown really mean development? Or does, it, does the red mean towers? And could this be a new type of habitation? Probably in the middle of rainforest? Or in the island? of in the middle of South, South China Sea or swamps in Amazon. What does it really mean? And um, not so long ago, I was introduced to GAN and I was fascinated by how the system works. And from my small research uh, or what you can do with AI, I bumped into so-called AI erotic chat. And that, ha that, that has become a moment when I, I thought, okay, let's do GAN on erotic image and see what they produce. Um, the, the results are fascinating. Uh, um, as you can see here, the first and second looks almost like they, 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 they can produce the body part. There is an idea of skin color or even the organs. Um, is, if, if everybody's still following? Yes, oh, yeah. we're here. Okay. Yeah. Well, just want to make sure that everybody is not 
falling asleep. <laughs> no, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's continue then. Until the third, it starts to show a context. So, and, and which is, which is, you can see it's, it's an interior of a room. I, I would suggest this is an uh, interior of a room. And somehow looking deeper to these images, um, you can pay attention on their quality. They, they, they have a certain type of quality. It comes to me even in the in the image-based script. Uh, it's inevitable, but but of course we have to project something to them. We cannot. Uh, I I don't think a GAN can produce meaning, but we can. We as a as a some as the other can can pro, can project a meaning on it. And it's still it's inevitable to my brain to project. Uh, a dualism between like eroticism and horror in, 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 in those images. Some even uh, trauma and desire, they, they, they somehow lay in the very same plane. There's only a very thin lines that border them. I mean, another curiosity, I ran them into uh, recognition and the, res are, the results are even incomprehensible. They were recognized as human, and there are some elephants. Like, I, I just don't know how 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 this thing how how does it translate this thing as a an elephant, for example. So, I can begin to see that uh, there's a multiple themes here. There's a trauma and desire, and also the can hallucinate about human and non-human from the image that for us. Um, I don't know, for me at least, it wasn't, it was more like a, a compilation, a collection of uh, organs, forms, and, 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 and scholars. So I would say God hallucinates more than us. And I, 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 this takes out will be my principle for my next project. Uh, parallel with the topic of otherness, um, I mean, me as a person with conflicting backgrounds, being you know Indonesian national, a Chinese descendant, living in Germany, I always find a post-colonial theme is something that I have to work on. And uh, at this moment, I, I this is where I recall to this uh, guy. His name is Raden Saleh. Maybe no, maybe nobody here knows him. Uh, but he is a vigor of a romanticist painter from uh, Dutch East Indies, a modern day Indonesia. He is considered in the country as a father of Indonesian modern painting. So he is a uh, Arabic descent in Indonesia. Um, and then uh, he was in contact when he was really young in contact with a Belgian painter that got sent from uh, the Netherlands. I mean, that was used to be Holland's or Dutch, right? Um, to paint the series of landscape from in, in the colonial countries. And he recognized young Radin Saleh and he decides he, he would like to persuade Dutch authorities to give him scholarship because he's so talented. And so yeah, so he got sent to the to 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 the Netherlands to uh to study romanticist painting when at that era was really in the early in the early 1800 was very famous in Europe. And he went on some exhibitions and uh a lot of Dutch people were very, very uh, surprised how somebody with this, um, I mean, he is definitely not white. He, is, uh, he has a dark skin. He can master a painting that the most of the European think this only can be done by the Europeans. And of course there's the, he's a figure of controversy because you see here is a famous pic, uh, portrait of him dressing as a European man. But sometimes he is picked 
he is a uh, picture as uh, for example on the left he looks like an arabic man, arabic man i mean this is how this is not how we how they um, put clothes in indonesia at that moment it's more like the one on the right but there is an issue there is an issue in the romanticism that they romanticize uh something they romanticize the, some of the subjects for example like these two um this is his usual subjects uh the the message always there is a savage animal savage human and other continents exotic nature as the background um but this is not how he's being important in the scene so this is a, this is not his work but this is a this is a work that probably become a reference for how he's, he will be well known of. So this is a painting of the surrender of a prince. So he's a freedom, freedom fighter, he's fighting against Dutch. So the, uh, the events itself doesn't take, it, it, I would say it's roughly in the same era when he was sent to the, to, to, to the Netherlands. And um, what is, what is, what is uh, uh, interesting about this painting is the, pa the, pa the painting name is the surrender of the prince, but actually the event was not the surrender of the prince. What actually happened is he is invited to a negotiation and promised keep safe. And they lied and ambushed him right after he left the negotiation. And, uh, and when Garden Salis stays in Europe, he saw this painting and he made a response to it. This is his response. He take the exact same composition of that of this previous painting. He mirror it left to right, right to left, and he distorted all the proportion. That's why you can see that uh, the well, the, the the Western man looks kind of like disproportionate. Looks almost very caricature. Um, so he's famous because his manipulation to painting to respond to his political stand. And during his stay in, in, in Europe, he also uh, was, he had some residency in Germany, in Weimar, in Dresden. And he also made this little pavilion in the Maxen, in Sachsen. Um, he also produced this painting. Uh, the painting is still in Germany. Uh, it was one of his earliest study of, uh, you know, and how, how animals symbolizes powers, like how, for example, how a lion becomes a symbol of uh, the Netherlands, how a bull become the symbols of uh, the Javan ruling class. And um, maybe it wasn't so clear at for you at first, but this is a painting of a rhino. And I, I would presume uh, that these two animals are, the, the two tigers are attacking the, the rhino. Um, I, 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 I became to, to be interested in this painting because this is, I mean, not so many people uh, talk about this painting. I mean, it's considerably something, but aesthetically, I would say this painting is closer to this painting the way that it's kind of disproportionate rather than this perfect proportion romanticist painting that uh, he was famous for in Europe. And there's also this uh, feature of a rhino. And uh, I mean, if you, if you do some research about um, art history, is there's not so much depiction of a rhino in the, in the art history because it's a, it's a symbol of potency, symbol of strength that you have to take from far away Asia. Like for example, uh, of course you have the famous rhinoceros of Durer uh, that becomes a, it's a, it's a wood, wood print uh, uh, work. And then there is a, a reference to that, which is on the right, which is the rhino of Dali. And um, I, I don't know how rhinoceros becomes 
the phase of our practice these days. There is, uh, I mean, I, 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 went to, I went to some gossip on the uh, Rhino forum that apparently uh, the developers of Rhino is really fascinated into Rhino. And even in the modern, uh, I would say, European media, Rhino is depicted as something that are very uh, strong and very uh, aggressive. It's com completely different than this NURPS Rhino program that is always so smooth. I don't want to go get there. <laughs> and uh, this is some um, some sculptures that I did uh, through time since I was uh, in, in during my stay in Germany. And I think this is a uh, I, I try to bridge all this information and through the research to embody what I um, what I probably would say as a, as a translation of, uh, not a translation, as a, I, I try to look at the, 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 the painting as not as an aggression, but probably as something else. Probably, you know, probably they are actually caressing each other. Probably they are uh, involved in some uh, interspecies sexual relation and um, with the same technique I try to preserve the, the exact size of the drawing not the painting and uh, build it in flat as uh, in, in a flat sculpture I always been interested lately in the flat sculptures like how is it not uh, in until when how flat it is that you can tell that a sculpture is a painting and how how uh, 3D it is, can you tell that a painting start to become a sculpture? And also because, uh, because I conceptually wanted to translate the, the, the original size of the picture of the painting itself, and it doesn't fit on a commercial uh, Kilner. So I began to, okay, maybe it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to to make it more abstract instead of taking one to one uh, the size of the painting itself. But why? What if I ma manipulate the outlines? And it gave me this these pictures. This is the result of the work. I mean, as you can see that the tiger was not very clear is, are, are, they, are, they, are they actually very aggressive? And uh, you don't know if the rhino is actually a, an animal or is it actually the background like the, the, the rainforest? And I, I, I took away the, the idea of exotization of the object itself by representing it always in uh, always in this uh, jungle. There's always this uh, sceneries of mountain and coconut trees. I would like to take it away and focus on the interspecies relation. And I I I wouldn't say it's a finished project. I think this is a project that I would I would like to still continue with um, to be fascinated with a lot more um, interesting subjects uh, that was kind of exoticized by some culture more than the rest. So yeah, I'm curious. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Oof. Thank you. I mean, I always admire how you split yourself in half, like practicing in a firm and also, you know, like doing sparkly to the sign. I mean, most of 